Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for coming uh, to this talk. Um, so uh, I get to talk about something which I'm both very passionate about and I have the, the wonderful pleasure of doing for my work time as well. So it's, I'm kind of working. Um, uh, so I currently work for the uh, Australian federal government. And one of my the projects I'm in charge of is data.gov.au, which is very cool. So I've spent the last 12 months very specifically learning a lot about this space and what works and what doesn't work. And so I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey of what we've been doing, but at the same time, I'm not here in an official capacity. I'm here just as a geek who has um, done some cool stuff that wants to share it with you. So no, none of this is representing the federal government or the Department of Finance or indeed any other entity that you want to put me to. <laughs> so um, for today, I am just Pia. So the first thing that's worth noting, I, I did a similar thing for um, the talk I did in the mini-conf. Most of my slides don't have lots and lots of words, but some of them do, just so that it's an easy reference for you later on. So don't worry about taking notes or anything, because I've tried to put references and links in here that will be useful to you. But it's worth noting, how many people here have read the new federal government's e-government and digital economy policy? So yes, there's two of us. Um, the reason that that's an important thing to bring up first up is because we have a new government, obviously, as of September. We have, um, and that... Um, uh, and the policy was released five days before the election called the e-government digital economy policy. And, um, and so that is now government policy that, you know, the public service and um, government are in the process of working out how to implement. And it's, I have to say, as a person who loves tech and who loves trying to do cool stuff with tech and government, it is spectacular. It's really, really cool. It's got some really interesting stuff in it. Um, and when I first read it, I thought, you know, this could be really quite incredible. This policy could potentially set up the next 20 or 30 years of how government deals with IT and, and its relationship to IT. So it's really quite spectacular. It's worth reading. It's not particularly long, <laughs> so don't be too uh, freaked out by the fact it has the word policy in it. But um, I pulled out some of the big things that I thought might be of interest to you, particularly from a data perspective. So first of all, it very specifically says that it wants a public consultation for the, um, uh, with you know, industry, with the general public about what data people want to see. So we've launched a thing, um, the data request site at uh, datagovu.ideascale.com. Uh, for people to be able to request data sets. And in only just over a month, I think there's been about uh, 50 data sets requested, 200 votes, 100 people registered. So, you know, it's relatively slow building, but, um, but that's great because it gives us an idea about what to prioritise with going and trying to target opening up of data, which can be a very tricky thing to do. The second thing it does is ask for, us to, for a review of the big data strategy. How many people here knew that there is a big data strategy right now? Yeah, exactly. So there's a lot of things going on at the moment, and um, one of my goals for this talk is, first of all, to tell you a bunch of stuff that might be useful to you, but also, more importantly, to give you ways to find out and keep up to date with information as it's happening, so that if you are interested in this space, you'll be able to, uh, to follow what the, the latest is up to. The third thing it asks for is to seek proposals for public and private partnerships using data to improve services, and I'm um, looking at funding some of those, so that might be of interest to some of the people in the room. Um, and one of the other things it asks for uh, specific, to big, uh, to specific to data, which is very interesting, is to start actually putting out their public dashboarding and league tabling of um, the efforts and performance of uh, the public service, which is really cool. <laughs> um, so, uh, and one of those specific things it asks for is, uh, and a number of this is relevant to us, but online engagement, platform agnostic services, yes. Uh, availability of data sets and customer satisfaction. So at least two of those are of enormous interest to um, a lot of people in the room here, but um, probably three or four even. Um, there's a lot of other stuff that's in that policy, but the other one that will be of interest to people here is that government interactions that occur, occur more than 50,000 times um, should be achieved online by 2017. Now, you can imagine even intuitively the enormous amount of infrastructure that needs to go into place to make that happen. So a lot of change is happening in the next little while. There's a lot of need for um, the sort of skills that this community has to bear, has to bring, and, um, and I think it's going to be uh, a very interesting time. So, so the stars are currently aligned for this stuff, but it's worth noting the stars have been aligning for a while. So we had a thing called the Gov2.0 policy in 2009. How many people here read that? Not many, not a couple. Um, that was a, a policy um, that was uh, influenced by a thing from the UK called the Power of Information Task Force. It was all about trying to, um, looking at how to make government more responsive, more open, more um, engaging. And, um, and so the gov a Task Force report had a few outcomes that have been implemented over the last four years. The Declaration of Open Government that was launched in 2010, just before the election. Um, 
there was a, a policy that was put in place that said that by default, all federal government, keeping in mind this is all federal government um, information, um, which naturally extends to data, uh, should be CCBY by default, um, or another open um, license, as it says in the policy, um, by default, unless there's a very specific reason otherwise. Now, of course, how well that's been enforced or policed and all the rest of it is a different question, but the fact that that is the policy standard is, is a great thing, because when I you know, call up a department and say, so, uh, you want to open up some open data, do you? Uh, you? You will, of course, be using the government default recommendation of CCBY. They say, oh, yes, of course. When you pose a question like, what licence do you want to use as the starting point, you know, then the lawyers get involved and that takes a really long time. So um, that's a good outcome. Uh, an information commissioner was put in place. DataGovU was one of the recommendations. The DataGovU was set up specifically as an outcome of the gov 2 task force report. Um, and there was a whole bunch of social media strategy and policy and advice and stuff that came out of that as well bunch of information about cloud services. Over the last few years, there's been heaps of supporting uh, tech policies and stuff that, and copyright policies that have happened. The other big thing is that over the last few years in particular, and in particular the last 18 months, um, we now have five of the states and territories all have their own data portals um, and their own data strategies, their own open government or open data or both policies in place. You know, so there's a lot happening that's really been sort of a bit of a, a slow build up from four or five years ago that's really ramped up in the last year or two, which is uh, quite exciting. And there's a lot of alignment now across the territory, states and federal government, and indeed a lot of the local governments. There's a lot of local governments that are doing um, fantastic stuff across a number of states um, in, the, in the country, which is kind of cool. So stars are aligned. Stars have been aligning for a while. Uh, just to give you a, I'm not going to go through all of these, but there's a lot of different pieces of paper that have different aspects of this that are worth looking at. If you're interested, this is just really about a reference, but there obviously on the left is the government's policy that's worth having a look at. But there's a number of policies in this space that um, are related. Of course, there's no single cohesive open data policy for the federal government yet, uh, and um, that might be something useful to do. So, um, and here's what's kind of happening around the, around the country. I gave a talk on Monday at the Open Gov mini-conf, so rather than rehashing a, a lot of that, I'm just going to sort of give you, you know, this has been a bit of a picture and I, I recommend you go and have a look at the talk or the notes from that talk to get a little bit more about what's happening more broadly in open government. And now I'm going to dive pretty much just specifically into open data stuff. But, um, but there's a lot of stuff happening around the country, a lot of tech being put in place, a lot of policies that have been put in place, and a lot of trying to look at opening up more data for government. How many people here were in the Open Gov Mini Conf on Monday? Uh, a few, but not, uh, probably about a quarter. So I am going to be rehashing a, a little bit of the content uh, that's relevant specifically to open data, so just bear with me. Why open up government data? This is actually, it's an important thing to consider because if you walk into a meeting with someone and you just have the, the core assumption that, you know, of course we're going to open up data, and that person doesn't have that same core assumption, then you immediately run into a culture clash that you don't quite understand. <laughs> I remember a few years ago um, when I was working in a previous job that um, I came across the issue of the Magna Carta um, around Australia has, I don't know if any of you have seen it, but Australia has one of the best preserved copies of, the Magna, of one of the original copies of the Magna Carta in Parliament House in Canberra on public display and it is awesome and it's a fantastic document and it's worth checking out. Um, but um, what's interesting is they decided to digitise it, to make it available online so people could go and interact with the Magna Carta. And that's all very, very cool. So we put in a request um, from within um, <laughs> the, my office uh, when I was working up at Parliament House. We put in a, a request to get a copy of that under Creative Commons licence so that we could publish it publicly. So <laughs> that was an interesting experiment in the culture of, of, of how different people approach this space because we sort of put in the request and they said, oh, you can have it under Crown Copyright. We said, no, we want it under Creative Commons. Well, you can have a low resolution version under Creative Commons. No, we want a high resolution version under Creative Commons. Why do you want that? It went back and forth and we, we I mean, at one point I was thinking about just hacking the system entirely and, and just filling out the form and just, you know, but, but making it misleading. I was thinking about all kinds of ways I could just make it happen, but I thought, no. Let's have the conversation and figure out what on earth is actually going on here. What is the actual blocker? to this happening. So I had a very frank and fearless conversation with the lady who was the, um, the, the um, custodian of this data set, of this, of this cultural asset. And we got into this conversation, it was quite, um, quite rigorous. And I said at one point, because uh, she's talking about what are you going to do with it? And I said, well, we're just going to make it freely available. Um, but, but we make postcards with that, so what? Um, but, um, and we got to this point, and, and I realised that a lot of the arguments she was making about the economics were rationalisations. They, they were 
they were rationalizations, but they weren't the core reason. So I started potting and proking and like, like I do. And finally, finally we got to this moment where I said, um, but you know, it's, it, it's arguably rather out of copyright. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, and, um, and I said, and it, and it should be freely available. It's the Magna Carta. And she said, yes, it's the Magna Carta. And I was like, oh, I think I get it. I think I get it. I think because it's so important, it should be available to everyone. She thinks because it's so important, it needs to be protected from everyone. This is the basic difference of perspective. So nowadays, one of the things, so I mean, and I need to be aware as a person trying to do this work within government, that, um, that the perspective I come from is very much shaped from this community, from our community, <laughs> and from a series of perspectives um, that, um, that not everyone necessarily shares. So once I started talking to her, and, and generally you'll see that this is, um, if you're interested in this space, that this is one of the things that's really proliferated throughout the cultural sector, particularly in Australia at this point in time, and certainly around the world as well. The argument of, but people should have access to it, is a scary one. The argument of, if you make it publicly available, it will become the authoritative source, right, rather than someone's iPhone snapshot of it taken, you know, in a dodgy light last week, being the authoritative source because no one can get a good copy of it. If you, if you are the authoritative source, then that is better for the um, asset itself. It's better for you. It helps show it off in a good light, which gets more people coming to visit it, and there's a lot of studies that have proven that. And, um, and that argument of the, being the authoritative source is actually one of the most compelling that I've found for a lot of people, whether it's data, whether it's cultural assets, whether it's a lot of other things. And that's, that's an interesting lesson that that Magna Carta experience showed me. Just for the record, the Magna Carta has not yet been liberated, and I'll get back to that one shortly. So. <laughs> Um, so why open up government data? There's a few arguments that have worked, um, but fundamentally around the world, different agendas in this space tend to come around three core things. It tends to be either about transparency and accountability, and that's been a big push in the UK, you know, all about transparency, about opening up, being more, more open to people. And, and you'll find, and this isn't about being cynical, it's about understanding motivation, you'll find that a lot of new governments come in and then talk about transparency in, as a mechanism to flame the old government. And that's fine, because they set a new bar and then they can be held to the same accountability. It's great. Um, the second area that tends to be brought up is around innovation and value adding. And that's probably the core focus and the economic benefits. That's probably the core focus of the current federal government and it's certainly a focus in some of the other states as well. And that, that's the idea that um, government in, a, in of itself in a siloed fashion, if it just keeps the data to itself, can't really do a lot more with it, can't really value add all that much, can't get the maximum economic benefit from, that, from the necessary creation of that data. So by opening it up, it allows opportunities for startups, for companies, for civil society, for other agencies, for other governments. So, you know, we have a lot of jurisdictions around Australia who perhaps collect the same data, and so you know, it, it becomes a more um, effective way to value add um, to government data sets. Publicly funded information should be publicly available is a bit of a meme that started to, um, to develop in, in this space, which is kind of interesting. But then the third one is around better public services and data. And this third one is also a focus of the federal government um, and, and, and a major focus of several of the states and territories as well. This is the idea that um, rather than 10 departments you know, collecting and managing the same, effectively the same data set, collect at once, which means you get more consistency of information, high quality data, more efficiency across the board, all that kind of stuff. Um, you then get the opportunity to start aggregating the data in a more effective way to say, okay, well, government is an API. The concept that if all services and data was available programmatically, then rather than having you know, a, a website for this program and this program and this program and this program, being able to say, well, let's have a, a website for health. I just wanna say, what are all the health services available to me? And it should just be able to tell me, regardless of the department, regardless of the jurisdiction, <laughs> regardless of, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. So um, it, it starts to build opportunities for getting better services and data. And these things all are interlinked. Um, the, the three core pillars of open government, uh, well, Gov 2.0, you know, open government in a digital age, are open data, participatory government, and citizen-centric services, this, you know, um, personalised type of service delivery for um, an online service delivery for people. They all relate to each other. You know, you can't do one to the exclusion of the others, but if you do one, it helps strengthen the others. So, some of the benefits, there's a bunch of community benefits. Um, obviously, you know, the transparency sort of arguments is uh, one that people generally intuitively understand, and it can be both a 
um, positive thing to talk about and a scary thing to talk about, depending who you're talking to and what data set you're talking about. <laughs> um, but then there's participatory democracy opportunities uh, for people to get involved in decision making, to be more informed, that kind of stuff. Innovation, economic, I've spoken about them briefly. But again, the key thing that I've found in the last year is that um, it's important to understand how human nature works if you want to get anything done, right? <laughs> and the fact is that people are driven, um, if, if you can't align the natural motivation of a person or an organization or a system with whatever it is you're trying to achieve, then even the most enthusiastic actor in that place right now will not make it sustainable. So to make it sustainable, you have to align what you're trying to achieve with the motivations of the, the players involved. So we've gone out and sort of said, okay, well, what are the benefits to government in doing open data? Like, are there benefits to government in doing open data? Because that ends up becoming a way that then it can actually get its own budget line, for instance, rather than just being someone's pet hobby that happens after the fact. So benefits to government in open, opening up data. These are some of the ones that we've found that have been quite beneficial and proven and there's evidence and all that kind of stuff. And it starts to get agencies thinking about open data as something that can help them do their job better and have, because everyone agrees with the, um, the public benefit and the economic benefit and the, the transparency benefit, but it doesn't mean that they can then allocate budget to it or allocate a resource to it or you know, actually get someone working on it. Um, so this gives them a, 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 effectively the business case to say, well, how can we now allocate resources to doing this job? So um, it's more efficient to share data. I've sort of spoken about that briefly. Um, the automated publishing argument, though, makes a lot of sense. So a lot of departments have stuff that they must report on by law right now. And so you know, there's a person that's responsible for getting the data set, cleaning it, checking it, putting in, probably converting it to a PDF, um, and then putting it online. Um, so if we can say to them, well, look, first of all, the way that you can then reuse that data, let alone other departments, is very limited because you're putting it out as a PDF, and here's why that's a bad idea. And by the way, the argument that if it's a PDF, it's more secure is completely bogus, and here's a screen scraped version of the budget, and that's why it's a bad thing. So. Um, once you get past that argument, um, then you can start saying, what if we help you with some tools that can pull the data out from the source within your organization? You can then verify it for sure, easily enough, but then it pushes it upstream um, to you know, DataGovU or some other publishing mechanism automatically. So we've just saved you two hours a month, or we've saved you an hour a day, or we've saved you four hours a year. We've saved you some time of some measure. And if we can do that for 100 data sets in your organization, you've now got an efficiency you can report and you can allocate those resources to more high value stuff, right? So it's all about resourcing and it's all about the fact that the public service is under a lot of pressure <laughs> to, um, uh, to be more efficient and effective and, so, and to demonstrate efficiency. So this gives them something they can report. Good for everybody. Um, improves government operations. Obviously you get better opportunities for collaboration when people have access to the data. One, <laughs> I had one department um, say, uh, and I won't name the department, but they said, um, oh, we can't possibly open up our data because we've got 29 definitions of this particular term and uh, internally, just in our one organisation. And, um, and if we put that out there, then, you know, first of all, people might, might misunderstand it, but second of all, um, people will see the errors in our data. And I sort of said, well, aren't you somewhat concerned that you're currently making decisions based on data that you don't think is good enough for other people to see? <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know, there's, a, there's, this, there's this misalignment of um, the risk of doing something above and beyond what we're doing, but we're currently doing what we're doing, and so that's okay. So, there's the, so this is not just drawing questions about opening up data, but it's drawing questions about the current quality and, and management and control of data, which is, um, which is important. And so it's actually creating new opportunities to do that stuff better, which is cool. Data quality, opportunities for evidence-based and iterative policy, goodness, how crazy would that be? Um, and um, it's creating that opportunity to say, well, what, uh, how can we measure stuff better? How can we get better statistics, better data, that kind of stuff? And then innovation. I mean, a lot of people think that government can't possibly innovate, but um, it, it is actually very innovative, particularly when it's under a lot of pressure. Um, and this actually creates opportunities to internally be able to reuse data across different departments in, in you know, new and useful ways, which is kind of cool. Um, oh, and then there's the opportunity, which is a conversation I don't usually have with departments up front because it scares the crap out of them, which is, well, what if we you know, took input from the public on your data set? You know, let's, let's choose something fairly easy, okay? Your barbecue um, location data. Uh, why wouldn't we make it so that people could upload a new GPS coordinate? Um, and then it's publicly available as an unverified data point. And once you verify it, it's then marked as verified. And so there's always a differentiation between what's official, you know, authoritative source versus what other people have contributed. But once it's verified, you know, you've got a better quality data set. Our, um, 
so the Department of Finance's data set on the last 14 years worth of contract data, so every contract over the value of $10,000 is publicly available today, um, and, um, and that data set had, oh, what was it? One of the, um, the teams from GovHack last year um, took that data set, did some really cool stuff with it, and then came back to the Department of Finance formally and said, so we've got 290 um, representations of the Department of Defense, different representations, so, you know, with a C or a, an S or DOD or defense or D, defense with different capitalization or 290 different spellings of the name of the Department of Defense. Wow, <laughs> that's horrendous. So. That's kind of cool. So they've given that data back to us, cleaned up and made beautiful, and I'm in the process of trying to get it verified now, and then we can release it as a high-quality data set that then helps everybody. So that's really, really cool. Um, so, and then, you know, and then we can say to departments, well, see, we've done it, so why can't you do it too? So there's, there's a lot of people throughout government trying to show a little bit of leadership and stuff, but it's hard. Sorry? This person saying they can't believe it. It's free text. It's free text. Yeah, it's free text, exactly. So that's what's happening, is that this is the, the contract data that they have to report back, and it's not as automated as it could be, shall we say. So, I mean, if it was like, you know, which department are you from, you have these options, you know, unless they specifically wanted to misreport to pretend to be from, I don't know, Museum of Democracy, which could be fun. Yeah, we've got these tanks. <laughs> you know, I'm sure the Museum of Democracy needs some tanks. Anyway, so um, <laughs> I'm not saying that. Don't, yeah, I don't think that would be an option. <laughs> All right, in the form, shall we say. So, um, I'll give you a bit of background on data.gov.au and in terms of what that journey um, has been like. Um, so my previous life was working in industry for a lot of years. Um, then I got tapped on the shoulder and offered a job to work as an IT advisor for a uh, policy advisor for a politician. And even though I'm deeply apolitical, I, I, you know, I love democracy, I don't particularly like politics, um, I, um, I saw it as a really great opportunity to see how the system works. I mean, as someone who, from the outside, from this community, has um, been lobbying about open source, about the US Free Trade Agreement, about a number of things for many years, I saw it as a great opportunity to see how things work. So, from within that office, um, I learned a lot about the legislative and executive arms of government. And then I wanted to go and work in the administrative arm of government. I wanted to work on tech. I wanted to work on open government, open data, if I could. But I wanted, more importantly than anything, to see how the whole of government works. Like any good sysadmin, I'm trying to figure out where the config files are and start tweaking them. Um, <laughs> so um, I was very, very lucky to be able to find a job at Department of Finance, which is more appropriately called the Department of Whole of Government. Um, and, and work within the tech team there to who is now the Australian government CTO. It's kind of the perfect job for like a geek like me. So um, when I asked for and got given um, the ability to take over and start running data.gov.au, um, so it's literally been 12 months since I started. So in 12 months we've relaunched data.gov.au on uh, an open source platform, a proper data publishing platform. Um, uh, you know, that actually does, previously it was a WordPress with an Amazon um, data store, basically. So it was basically just a WordPress with a lot of files linked that you could download. And that was fine, because in 2009, there wasn't really a lot of options. Like, that wasn't a terrible um, idea. But of course, by 2013, that was a little bit out of date, and there was a lot of options on the market. Prior to doing this, um, I was working in the ACT government, and I actually launched data.act.gov.au, which is on Socrata, which is actually a proprietary open data platform. And um, so the experience now of dealing with both of those platforms and what they both mean was, was very interesting. And, um, and I've got a reasonable idea about you know, doing data publishing for this kind of data you know, reasonably well. So, um, so we've launched on the new platform. Uh, we've done a lot of work to clean up the data. And this was a good lesson as well in um, some of the fickleness of, um, of trying to be transparent. As many of you will know, or if you don't know, you will be rapidly picking up. I tend to try to do things in a fairly open way and a fairly transparent way, and, um, and very much in back collaboration and trying to open up um, what I do uh, to public scrutiny so that I can, because I know that way that if I get it wrong, I will get my ass thoroughly kicked by you guys, um, which is good. It's very, very important to have those checks and balances. So with um, data.gov.au, when I went to start um, and my team started cleaning it up and looking at all the data that was on it. There was 1,200 data sets on it, right? 1,200 back before we relaunched. A third of those data sets were links to files, largely files, or pages that didn't exist anymore. Woo! A third of those data sets belonged, was data that belonged to states and territories that had since launched their own data platforms and wanted to host their data on their platforms. Fantastic! That's great. That's a net win. I'm not 
parochial about trying to, you know, just get numbers for the sake of numbers. That's a very, um, I don't know if you, want, if you know about the difference between the UK and US approach, but the US approach has, unfortunately, because they were so focused on getting numbers, uh, in, in some cases, they said, um, they took, in one particular case, one data set, split it into like 300,000 files, all right, and then started uploading them. And so it's like, oh, well, we've got 300,000 data sets. Well, <laughs> yeah, but how useful are they? I don't know. Um, so we're trying to take the UK model, which is less data sets, but more high value stuff and, and that kind of stuff. So um, I've had a few cases already where it's been like, well, we could add these as 1,000 data sets, or we could add them as 10 data sets with 100 <coughs> files each, which is actually more useful to the person. So we've tried to take an approach which says, um, making it high value from a user's perspective, from a developer's perspective, from the sort of people who want to reuse the data's perspective. So we've relaunched it on CCAN. How many people here have used CCAN? A couple, all right. So basically what CCAN is, um, so there's lots of different types of data out there and specialist data publishing that already exist. Spatial data is an area that is well understood, the standards are well established, the technologies are well established, the skills are well established, and, um, and even though you get into arguments about what should be open freely or what should be not or what should be sold, that's a different argument. The technologies themselves are reasonably well established and you can find a lot of data services in that space that are, are well understood. However, um, DataGovAU, so DataGovAU is not trying to be the be all to end all and the place to publish all kinds of specialist data. Where data services already exist, like some of the spatial data sets and, and science data sets out there, it will provide links to those data sets, but um, it's filling the niche for hosting data that, um, uh, and to make it more accessible that doesn't fit into that category. So a lot of the administrative data. So a lot of the data we deal with, there is no single standard. There is no single um, data dictionary. There is no um, well-established way that it's developed. There is no, so I mean, often enough, the source file that we're dealing with is some random XLS that sit, or XLS X, even worse, that's sitting on someone's hard drive that's not even backed up locally within the organisation. Um, we're not. We're dealing with very unstructured, random sorts of data, and that that's cool because you know it's still useful. I mean, some of it, you know, it might be crime statistics. It might be. Um, a list of all the, um, um, well, one of my favourite ones was a, um, a lot of the boarding records of um, convicts from the First Fleet. You know, it's a, some of this data is, is historical, some of it's um, current, but it's, it, there's certainly no consistency to it. So we're trying to create a place which, so what CCAN does, which is clever, provides a, a way to link to data services in a useful way, provides a way to host unstructured data, and when you upload the unstructured data, whether it's a CS, so long as it's clean data, and I'll get to that, but a CSV or an XLS, when you upload it, it's kind of clever, but kind of stupid. It's, it's simple in the Unix way of doing things, which is kind of cool, where it says, okay, what's the basic, you know, number of things this way, number of things this way, and then it generates um, a JSON API for every data set that, um, that basically just reflects the structure of that data as it was uploaded. So it doesn't try to be too clever, but at the same time it creates that kind of consistency of um, ease of access to all the data sets that go up, which is kind of easy and kind of cool. At the same time, the way it works is that there is a single API that gives you all the search results, and then you can start to tweak with the API to give you, you know, all the results from a particular organisation, or all the results from a particular category, or all the results from, a, from any of the metadata um, tags that you choose to build into the system. Um, so we cleaned up the data, found that basically two-thirds of our data was useless, uh, leaving us with about 400 data sets, and then we had a few new ones that could be added. Started writing to all those organisations and saying, who's your person? Are they up to date? Uh, why is your data two years old? Let's start working on this. And we've done a lot of work with getting a bunch of departments now back to starting to do regular publishing. And I'm glad to say that we're, we're now back up to, oh, actually I'll come back to that in a second. So it creates API access to unstructured data. It links through to existing data sets. We now have a policy which isn't the usual case around the world, but our policy is we will not link to files anymore. And the reason for that is because URLs change all the time. Uh, file, if, if they just want to link to, a, if they want to host a file on DataGovAU, they can upload it to DataGovAU, and that way at least we know that it's there. Um, and we want them to be responsible for that as well. Uh, what else does it do? So it does some basic data visualization, very, very basic data visualization. So it gives you like a basic graphing way to inter interact with the data and basic maps that, so you can interact with the data. But we're not really focused on that yet. We're mostly focused on trying to get quality publishing. You can't do any analysis or, or data views or any of that cool stuff um, or any developer applications or anything until you get quality data publishing. So right now and for um, you know, the next little while, we're really focused on trying to get the, the data publishing as high quality as possible. Um, part of that is assisting agencies with documentation, with automation tools, with data transformation tools, and I'll come to some of those in a second, some of the examples. So in terms of the roadmap, 
roadmap publishing was pretty much the second half of last year. We launched, I think, uh, July-ish, um, and, um, and basically was in beta for the first couple of months, which was fine. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's ticking along quite nicely. I think we're up to 660-odd data sets, and I'll come to the rest of the statistics in a little while. So this year is basically about improving the front-end tools a little bit, improving some more of the publishing and automation tools, um, helping skill up and educate agencies a lot more. And um, you'll notice that the earlier policies that the new government has set are very helpful for that. When I write to a department and say, hi, so uh, you have an account, but the, the email you gave us is bouncing. Um, you've got 10 data sets and none of them have been updated in the last two years. Um, and by the way, here's the new government's policy and we're going to start doing league tabling and you may want to get on top of that before we put that in place. Hi. <laughs> um, so it's kind of exciting because we now actually have for the first time in federal government in a, well, so well, for the first time in a long time, um, some leadership at that level, which is very helpful for getting things done. Um, so we're going to be doing a lot of value realisation work and the reporting and league tabling and, um, and again, continuing to help agencies with their publishing and then starting to look at ways to um, improve um, the ability for agencies to crowdsource, or uh, well, crowdsource, yeah, some of the data um, updatedness. Like, and it's not always going to be appropriate to do that. But in some cases, it will be appropriate to do that. So if we can make it so agencies can, at their choice, choose to take public input at a cellular level and then verify that and then have that publicly available, that'll be really cool. So it's going to be looking at a bunch of that kind of stuff. It's got um, oh, one of the other things. So there's good metadata sort of and, and good linked data kind of functionality that you can have in CCAN that we've been working on. Um, there, it's very easy to publish something if you're not technical. And that's been really, really important because a lot of the people who get dumped with the job of publishing data are not geeks. And so being able to say to them, okay, here's a web page, you can just go here, you can click here, upload your CSV, which you already had anyway, and done. Um, but if they're technical, we can also work with them and with their IT departments to actually start automating the publishing of data, which has worked really well. I've got one department now who um, has a script that we wrote for them that um, pulls data from their source, uploads it every day, um, and then they've written a mobile application that talks to the DataGovAU API to actually do mobile service delivery around their own data set. And from their perspective, that's great because it's infrastructure they haven't had to build. Uh, it's free for them to host. It means other people, and I think four or five applications have already um, been developed externally to government that use that same data set in some really cool ways. So, I mean, you know, they're, they're over the moon. It's, it's working really, really well. Um, but a big part of this is also just being able to find stuff. So <laughs> when you go to DataGovAU today and search, you know, there's not really that many data sets in the grand scheme of things, and you don't see any of the state results, really, and you don't see any of the data that's not linked there that exists in other parts of government right now. So one of the things we're looking at is um, having a federated search, so sharing metadata with the states and territories where possible, so that if you search in DataGovAU, or you search in DataVic, or you search in Data New South Wales, or you search in Data Queensland, or anyone that comes on board, and we're in discussions with them at the moment, then um, <laughs> you actually will see, here are the results from this jurisdiction, you may also be interested in other jurisdictions, and be able to actually start finding data so that there's no wrong door in. So we're having a look at some of those right now. Now, um, just, I don't think, th this isn't private by any stretch. Anyone can put this in and go and have a look and browse through these. I just don't think we've linked it to the front page yet because we only got it set up a little while ago um, and then I've been on holidays. But as you can, you may be able to see here, so we've got um, total data sets at the moment is only 668, um, but the total files um, is 4,700. And the only reason that's relevant is because previously, in the previous version, which I didn't mention before, 1,200, each data set was a single file. <laughs> so we've gone from 1,200 single files to 400 at when we launched data sets and I don't remember how many individual files it was, but um, up to 660 data sets, but you know, almost 5,000 files. So we are making progress. We're just not, um, uh, you know, and it, and it is not as fast as we'd like, but it's ramping up very, very quickly now and there's been a lot of work around that. So there's a bunch of data sets, there's a bunch of APIs, there's a lot of organizations getting involved and it's all very exciting. It has been a very tricky adventure in a lot of ways to learn how these things work, how to actually engage with government is quite different from engaging with community or, or with um, uh, corporate. But, um, but you know, we're, we're learning and I think we're making some fairly good progress. So how to find stuff for you guys. Um, we've got, this is, don't worry, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but the right hand side is all the policies in this space. The left hand side is all the data projects that we know of right now. So the top five, sorry, the top six of the data portals that exist, but then there's a bunch of spatial data. Um, it's worth, how many people have tried to use the ABS data, the Bureau of Statistics? 
A few, yeah. There's, there's generally been, um, and we heard on Monday as well, a, a bunch of complaints about trying to use ABS data. Um, it's worth noting that they've said publicly that they're in the process of implementing a far, far, far better API to be able to access um, statistical data appropriately. Um, a lot of, um, and, and that should be, I think, implemented this year. So it's worth keeping an eye out for that because it should make it a lot easier. But um, so that'll be a data service which will be um, really easily accessible. There's all the research data available, um, real-time data, um, and there's a lot of um, traffic data as well, some of which is static and some of which is real-time, which is available. So we've linked all the ones that we know of and we're adding to that all the time. So there's a reference for you for stuff to be able to find stuff. But then there's a lot of community stuff as well. One of my favourite projects, um, and it, again it was an outcome from um, GovHack, was some people just got together and started and, and wrote some software to go and just actively find a whole bunch of government data and, um, and wrote a thing called GovPond, uh, which is linked here as well in the community initiative section. And GovPond has you know, thousands of, of data sets that they've been able to automatically scrape and find. Now it includes everything from CSV style raw data sets through to PDFs through to a whole bunch of stuff and it's a fantastic resource and um, we're talking to them about how we might be able to integrate some of that with, into DataGovAU as well. But um, uh, there is a lot of data out there, it's just sometimes it's really, really, really hard to find. <laughs> so um, yeah, so the, the, here's a resource that you can click through to and click through to all the different uh, references there and it'll make it easy for you to find stuff whilst we're in the process of getting um, the federated search into all the data portals. Lots of different sorts of data. It's worth, um, it's worth just reiterating that because what I've found is that every data specialty has a, a community around it, has a standard around it, has, but they're very siloed. They don't tend to talk to each other. And so everyone sort of wants to be the um, a one ring to rule them all kind of you know, approach to, to data. But um, there are lots of different types of data and trying to get them working together is actually kind of the end goal and, and, and what we're trying to achieve with data GovAU. So we've ended up going talking to lots of people in different data disciplines and, um, and some of them are you know, boggled by the idea that maybe their metadata format doesn't apply to something completely different to their data. So it's, uh, it's been fun. Uh, there's lots of tools for hacking. Lots of tools for hacking. I actually recommend, with my um, with a different hat on, that um, every year um, there's a, a how-to that's set up for GovHack, and that involves it has links through lots and lots of tools, lots of which are open source, many the vast majority of which are open source, um, that you can click through to and have a look at. And because that competition runs every year, it's updated every year, um, and there's a lot of really useful stuff on there. So there's graphing tools, there's publishing tools, um, automation. So automation is about Tools that can take data from a source, clean it up or mash it together or merge it or whatever, yep, and then um, push that data somewhere else, whether it's into a file or up to a, an API or whatever. Kettle is a fantastic open source tool that you can say, okay, here's my Oracle database, here's my CSV file, here's my MySQL database, here's whatever. I want to pull these tables, these aspects of these tables. Um, I want to say fem equals female equals woman equals, you know, in, in these three data sets, so that now I'm creating a single data set which has consistent language, consistent approach, and push that up to data.gov.au, all in one fell swoop. Yay! So um, it's, it's a really cool tool to have a look at. A lot of the data visualization tools are not open source, but there are some really good ones, and I didn't actually put uh, D3 on it, but there's a whole bunch of them linked on the GovHack website. Fantastic analysis software out there, and it's worth noting, how many people have used Spook software? Anyone? One or two. Um, so the reason I bring that up is because we often look at some of the software tools out there that are used for things that maybe we, we don't like. <laughs> um, but we can apply those tools for stuff that we do like. Um, some of the Spook software I've found, um, which I was using for, weirdly enough, for some cons consultation stuff, just to get context, to say, okay, of the 80% of people that didn't like this idea, maybe 75% maybe of them work for the same company or are overseas, or are this particular demographic, or are the same IP address. That's a little bit cheeky. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, it, it's useful sometimes to get some context around these things. And so some of the Spook software is actually useful. There's a lot of API development tools out there and, and approaches and documentation, and um, a lot of application development tools and stuff as well. So there's a lot linked from there. And I kind of wanted to give you a very broad stroke here, but um, I can talk about stuff um, after the talk. But um, go to govhack um, slash howto, and that'll give you a lot of uh, click-throughs that you can have a play with. Um, it's worth noting that there's a lot of skills required in this space, so if you're actually thinking about changing jobs at all, <laughs> can I recommend having a look into this space because the demand for these skills is starting to go through the roof. Uh, there is a lot of um, need for it and there's a lot of app, uh, companies that are starting to spin up. At a time when one of the major media companies in this country was firing hundreds of journalists, they were hiring 
data journalist, which is kind of interesting. So I mean, there's a lot of demand for these skills um, in a lot of different areas, particularly in government. There's certainly a lot of challenges, um, both from a legal perspective, culture systems. You know, um, the biggest problem is the low tolerance for mistakes. When we make, you know, if I make a mistake with data government, you people just jump all over it, and of course it's a nefarious plot from the government to take over everyone. But usually it's just because something's stuffed up, and that's you know, if, if you don't take risks, how are you going to try something new? Um, but, um, but that's okay. So, you know, you've got to try things and, and we're trying a lot of new things and it's really, generally speaking, going reasonably well, I think. Um, but the big challenge, there's a lot of challenges, but the biggest challenge is that a lot of people who are involved in this space in government get really excited about big data and what we can do and how we can save the world and how it's the new cloud. Um, sorry, I get very annoyed about these things. And I keep having to remind people, look, that's great, but you can't do big data without data. <laughs> so. Let's get focused on publishing. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, we're fighting a bit of an uphill battle um, in some respects, but we're getting the message through and people are starting to understand that they actually need to publish if they're gonna get any of the benefits that they're all starting to talk about. There's a lot of ways to approach privacy and confidentiality. And one of the things I wanted to just suggest um, to keep an eye on is the idea that not all raw data should be available. If the census raw data was available, you could look up your neighbour and that would be bad. It's too easy to re-identify people given enough um, data points, right? Um, there was a study in the States that showed with postcode, um, date of birth and gender, you could re-identify about 87% of people. And that actually, that study is relevant to here because the postcodes there and postcodes here um, are reasonably similar in terms of the amount of people in each, uh, similar enough to be useful. So, um, so for instance, publishing date of birth, uh, sorry, uh, year of birth rather than date of birth, massively changes that, right? So there's, there's a lot of ways to start to publish data usefully, but then there's also automated ways. So the ABS's approach is that the data that's given back to you is anonymized on the fly by the API software itself, which responds to the request that you make. So it's actually very, very clever. Sorry? Oh. All right. So there's a lot of ways to do this kind of stuff um, and um, a lot of existing precedents in this area. And I guess the greatest opportunity is us, right? <laughs> the hacker culture in Australia is really awesome and there's a lot of people starting to get involved. Agencies and departments have been freaked out to see what a couple of people in 48 hours can develop. And it's not to say that they've developed a fully sustainable implemented solution that can be done forever. Um, it, but it is to say that what they've done in two days is usually better than what you know, a large multinational corporate could have done in six months. So, that's exciting. We are in a lot of ways leading the charge in this because we're changing people's perspective about innovation, what innovation really means, um, and people's perspective about what value for money means, and people's perspective about the value of opening up and being more collaborative as government and more open and transparent. GovHack, of course, one of my little pet projects, um, is um, running again this year in July, and I highly recommend you get involved. GovHack Perth uh, last year. Uh, won a, a huge amount of prizes um, um, for the size that they were and such, and they were very proud of it, and, and there's a big startup sector here in Perth, but around the country we had 1,000 developers in eight <coughs> cities, and we're hoping to have about maybe 2,000 uh, this year, but um, it's, you know, it's, a, it's fun, it's interesting, we get to show off our skills, we get to show not just the government sector, but the media and the, the broader community just how awesome we really are. Um, and so finally, the pieces are in place. There's policy in place, there's tech in place, there's tools out there that are freely available, there's data that's already available, and you can go and request more data, and, and, um, and the data request side is publicly available, and we go and chase all of those things up. Um, so basically, everything's in place, so have a play, investigate, show off, collaborate, have fun, and I'm gonna repeat the same quote I did on Monday, which is, you know, you gotta end with a bit of rage against the machine, I always believe. What better place than here, what better time than now? Um, any questions? Thank you. Yes. Um, how do you advocate approaching a government department where you're currently using WGET to scrape their publicly available database? Yep. Because if you're not careful, they'll end up turning off their publicly available database in the fear that you're scraping their database. Sure. I completely understand. <laughs> um, and um, what I would suggest you do is make a formal request for the data through the data request site and don't tell them you're scraping it. I didn't hear it. We're recorded. Hi, Mum. Um, so the <laughs> hi, boss, um, who is who probably is watching. Um, the, um, but um, so yeah. So let's keep that totally hypothetical. Um, but make make a formal request for the data request site because. 
The beautiful thing about the data request side is we're running it completely publicly. So every request, uh, we will respond, so uh, my team will respond to the data request publicly and say, uh, once it gets more than five votes, which you know, if it's a useful data set, it should get more than five votes. Um, uh, we go to the department and we say, the relevant department, and we say, look, this is a request we've made. By the way, here's the new government's policy. Your minister's already agreed to this, rah, 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 or whatever is appropriate to them. Um, and if they say no, then we say, that's cool. You just need to give us the reason to put up on the website. Um, so we're going to run that process, that request process, as publicly as possible. So make the request there, and that will help um, us to get them to do it, you know, in a, in a sustainable way, shall we say. And, um, and if you're doing, if anyone's hypothetically doing things that, you know, they shouldn't be doing, well, that, I just don't want to know, really. <laughs> so, hello. Sorry, you have to call that. <laughs> we're over time. Okay, thank you very much.